Good evening, everybody. Please be seated. The uh, Senate team this evening are very you. Uh, I'm not sure if we're streaming this evening or if we're recording, but to those of you watching this online, uh, just to say a warm welcome to all of you and uh, glad that you, can, that you can be joining us to really witness this uh, inaugural lecture by Professor Samuel Laria. My name is Professor Garth Stevens. I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor for People, Development and Culture here. That means that I'm responsible for all matters related to the professoriate in the Faculty of Engineering and the Built Environment. And it's truly a pleasure to be with you all this evening at this in all by Professor Samuel Laria from the School of Construction Economics and Management. Let me also take this opportunity to acknowledge those of you here tonight on behalf of WITS as members of the WITS community, as colleagues, as students, as friends, and importantly, just met your family, uh, Sam, so welcome to your family, and very, very pleased that your family can share this auspicious moment with you, um, and know that you are thrilled to have them here as well. So welcome to, welcome to all of you. I'd also like to welcome Professor Tukazani Majorzi, the uh, Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and the Built Environment, uh, Professor Bankale Awuzi, who actually tonight has been asked to very quickly step in as the titular acting head of school, because of course Professor Laria is also not only our inaugurating, he's also the head of school uh, for the School of Construction, Economics and Management. Uh, <clears throat> a warm welcome to Professor Emeritus Will Hughes. Welcome, Professor Hughes. Will Professor, Professor Laria. Let me just say that tonight is a moment when the university formally, publicly, and very proudly acknowledges the personal achievements of a scholar as he or she attains the highest rank of an academic within the university. It is the apex rank, the rank of the full professor. This is really an opportunity for us to acknowledge you, Sam, for your achievements only in the university, but also in the broader public domain. And so the inaugural lecture, historically, is open to any member of the public. It's free. And we really come here as a public or as multiple publics to share in the knowledge and the scholarship and the wisdom of the inaugurating professor. In 2002, he spent the next two years supervising construction projects in a local government assembly and in the development office of a university. And in 2004, he was awarded a scholarship by the Nguam Nkrumah University of Science and Technology to pursue an MPhil stroke PhD program in construction management. It was during this time that he had the opportunity to conduct academic visits to Georgia Tech University in the US, uh, the University of Reading in the UK, and the National University of Singapore. Following a second academic visit to the University of Reading in 2007, he was awarded an ORS scholarship by the University of Reading and transferred his PhD to Reading from Kwame Nkrumah, the University of Science and Technology. While doing his PhD under the supervision of Professor Will Hughes, who is also here with us this uh, evening, he was also a graduate teaching assistant. He completed his PhD in December 2008 and was appointed as a postdoctoral academic fellow in construction management in 2009. During this time, he published some highly cited papers on the relationship between risk and price in tendering in leading international journals. And I must say, that is the trait that has stayed with him till today. He was appointed as a lecturer in construction procurement in 2010 and served in this role until 2012 when he joined the University of the Verdwaterstrand. Four highlights from his time as a lecturer at the University of Reading were, firstly, he was the co-founded uh, co the West Africa Built Environment Research, or WEBA conference in 2009. 
He won the Research Endowment Trust Fund Prize for Best Research Output in the Faculty of Science in 2012. And he completed his postgraduate certificate in academic practice in 2012. Ultimately, he also won the university's best um, postgraduate certificate in academic practice project prize, and that was in 2012. Since, since joining this university, University of Verdwatersrand, as a senior lecturer in 2012, Professor Loria has been a recipient of the Friedel Cell Shop Award in 2012, a very prestigious award. Colleagues understand that. He's also been the recipient of a URC postdoc fellowship grant in 2014, and he's a C1 rated National Research Foundation researcher, meaning that he is one of the only 20% that are about rated scientists in the country, active scientists. He was promoted to associate professor at the School of Construction Economics and Management in 2013 and promoted to full professor in 2021. He was appointed as the head of School of Construction Economics and Management in 2021. Prof. Leria is a fellow of the Higher Education Academy, a chartered builder, a chartered surveyor, and a registered construction project manager with the South African Council for Project and Construction Management Professionals, the SACPMP. SACPCMP. May I then allow Prof. Leria to come to the platform? Okay. Um. Professor Steve, Professor Major, very, very much um, for the very warm um, introduction. Um, I also want to really, who are here this evening, um, to share this moment with me. Um, it is indeed um, an honor, and I'm very grateful um, for your presence. I also want to um, express my gratitude to all of you um, who have joined um, online. Um, I know that there are many of you um, who would have loved to be here today, but for one, one reason or the other, um, you cannot be here and you've joined us online. So um, thank you very, very much for um, joining um, online. Your presence is um, equally much appreciated. Um, I have been um, doing a few reflections um, in preparation you know, I mean, for today. And, um, one of the um, reflections was, you know, when I graduated, 21 years ago um, at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. And certainly, certainly um, not one of the options I ever contemplated. In here today, I mean, if someone had asked me back then what I thought I would be doing in a given an inaugural lecture, and um, to be standing here, you know, I have come. And I also want to thank, you know, I mean, um, a couple of people on whose um, shoulders I have stood, you know, I mean, um, to get to where I am um, today. I mean, first of all, um, I would like to acknowledge and thank, you know, I mean, um, all of my teachers, to whom secondary technical school, who were so outstanding, because that is where I first started, you know, studying construction, and those teachers were so standing in introducing me to the field of building construction. Secondly, you know, I mean, I have been very, very fortunate to work and um, study at some really outstanding universities. And here, I express appreciation um, to the coming colleagues, you know, I mean, um, in the time of my career. And so I want to thank all of my colleagues, you know, I mean, for the contribution and um, that you've all, you know, um, made in I mean um, to my um, career and just you know, looking um, through the audience I see that you know I mean a, 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 a couple of my colleagues here so um, thank you um, to all of you you know I mean for you know I mean contributing you know I mean um, in different ways you know I mean um, to my career. I want to thank my collaborators um, as well you know, um, here in particular you know I mean I want to acknowledge and thank Professor um, Ron Watermeyer um, I remember 
you know, I mean, um, even before um, coming, joining VT University formally, I had come on a visit, you know, I mean, to South Africa, and that was, you know, I mean, um, the first time I meeting with Professor Ron Watermeyer, and, you know, he has been a very big, you know, I mean, part of the success, you know, I mean, I have had um, during my time here at VT University. We've quoted a lot of um, together, we've done Supervised and graduated with I mean, PhD students together. So, um, Professor Ron Watermeyer, I really want to thank you and acknowledge your own um, contribution you know, um, to where I am currently. And I want to thank people like Professor Raymond Nkado um, as well. Um, Ray, I see that you are here. Thank you so much, you know, I mean, for made, you know, I mean, as well um, to, you know, I mean, the career I have enjoyed um, here um, at Wits um, University. And then, you know, I mean, the fourth group of people I want to acknowledge. You know, people, the people who have served, you know, you know, I often refer to Will as my sensei, you know, Japanese word, you know what I mean, for teacher. Um, and, you know, I mean, in the, not to someone, because in the few days that he's been here, you know, I mean, it's like I've had to relearn, I mean, all over um, again. So, Will, thank you, you know, I mean, also for, you know, being uh, my lifelong uh, teacher, you know, and I want to thank, you know, I mean, um, others like, you know, Professor um, as well. He's been a great mentor to me. Like Professor Giorgio Fogg for being great mentors to me. I want to thank all of them. And then I want to thank also, you know, the members of my Weber Conference family. These people inspired and shaped, you know, in my journey in a very significant way. And I have to mention this because in the past 15 years, these have been, um, you know, I mean, um, a very important part of my life. And lastly, um, and obviously, and if I don't do this, I'm going to be in trouble when I get home today. Um, I want to, you know, thank my family, you know, in particular my three girls that I live with, so my wife Florence and my daughter Janessa um, and Eleona, and obviously my family back home um, in Ghana. I'm sure that my mom and my brothers are probably watching, so if you are, thank you all very much for, you know, um, the contribution you have made, you know, I mean, um, in helping me, you know, I mean, to get to where I am today. Okay, um, so with that out of the way, you know, I mean, I want to talk um, very quickly about my research interests. You know, I mean, um, wh what I've tried to do, because obviously, you know, I mean, for an audience like this, I do recognize that, you know, I mean, there are a lot of non-technical people here. And so what I have tried to do is, you know, I mean, I was thinking about what's the best way to pitch this message in a way, you know, I mean, which, is, which doesn't make it too technical, and I don't lose a lot of you. So that's what I've tried to do. And so um, if I'm getting a bit too technical, you know, um, yeah, maybe just do some facial expressions and I'll get a message, um, and then I'm going to be less, you know, I mean, I'm technical. But in terms of, you know, I mean, my research um, work and, you know, um, the work I've done, you know, I mean, so far um, to get to this point, my, the focus of my research has been on analyzing tendering, procurement, and contracting um, strategies and processes in the construction industry to determine you know, I mean, how these processes can be improved to help improve infrastructure project outcomes and also um, value for money. So this has been you know, I mean, um, a lot of the work that I have done you know, I mean, to get to um, this point. And you know, I mean, in relation to construction tendering, um, for example, that was the subject of my PhD. And you know, I mean, that's really where um, I started from. And I remember um, you know, I mean, at the time when I first met Professor um, it's one of the reasons I have chosen, you know, I mean, the topic I've chosen today. I'm going to be speaking about, you know, I mean, um, achieving um, better infrastructure procurement and project um, outcomes. I'm going to get to that in a bit. But that is one area where I've done extensive research. And, you know, I mean, um, a lot of, you know, I mean, the insights I have picked up, you know, I mean, around you know, client practices or procurement practices um, that lead to better outcomes, you know, I mean, um, are the things I'm going to be sharing um, with you um, today. I also, you know, I mean, did research on the use of electronic procurement in the South African construction industry, and you know, I mean, to date, um, that, as far as I'm aware, is the largest, you know, I mean, study on electronic procurement that has been done. Robin, I'm glad you are here, and thank you so much for the funding you gave at the time, and which enabled me to, um, you know, I mean, recruit a postdoc um, to help, you know, I mean, carry out um, that project. A lot of the research that came out of that, you know, I mean, have gone on to be very, very highly cited as well, so thank you for your own contribution as well. And then I've done a lot of research also, looking at the relationship between procurement strategy and outcomes. And that is one area where I feel that we've got significant gaps, you know, when it comes 
to construction, procurement, and research. And I'll be sharing you know, some insights on that today. More recently, one of the areas I've been looking at, which I think is a really, really um, important area where we need a lot of research, is the area of how procurement can be used to achieve socioeconomic development outcomes. And this morning, I was having a chat with Will you know, I mean, um, about this. Elsewhere in the world, you know, I mean, it's called social value of construction, and that is one area where I think you know, we need to concentrate more research because infrastructure procurement really does have a, a huge amount of capacity to help us you know, I mean, um, achieve socioeconomic development objectives. And then um, recently as well, we've done, I've been looking at a lot of research on the relationship between fees and quality in the procurement of professional services, which for um, consultants who are in this room today, I know that this is currently one of the major um, hot topics you know, for consultants in the South African construction industry. I've got one or two thoughts on that, which I will share um, at the right time. And then I've also done you know, a lot of research looking at construction contracts. And in that area, the key thing I've been looking at is risk apportionment and commercial review or commercial relationships in construction contracts. And so um, these are the broad areas you know, I've been looking at when it comes to my research. And a lot of that research, you know, I mean, I'm glad to say, has actually you know, I mean, um, had a lot of you know, I mean, impact um, to the extent that some of that you know, I mean, um, has had impact in terms of it also um, informed the development of some of the new programs um, in my school. You know, so for example, um, last year we introduced a new PG diploma in infrastructure procurement and, del and, and delivery management, which as far as I'm concerned, you know, I mean, it's you know, I mean, um, the only one of its kind you know, I mean, um, anywhere in the world. So um, that has been good um, as well. Okay. And so um, with that background, I um, want to get into, into my, um, my presentation um, for today. What I want to talk about today, I mean, really, um, there, is, um, there is a lot of stuff that I could have you know, I mean, chosen to talk about today. But the area where I felt, you know, I mean, um, I could share you know, I mean, um, a couple of views, you know, I mean, which um, I think um, will be most relevant and, you know, and perhaps most useful is um, in relation to if some of the key things I have picked up um, in relation to how we can improve infrastructure procurement and project outcomes. That is one area where we currently do not do very well um, as an industry. And you know, I mean, through my research work, there are a couple of insights I've picked up, which I'm going to share with you um, this, um, this, um, this evening. Procurement like buying pens and you know, papers and printer and that kind of stuff. And then also, you know, I mean, when you think about you know, I mean, construction and um, procurement as well, there's very complex you know, I mean, supply chains involved in the process, which doesn't really make it the same as procuring, you know, I mean, um, general goods and services. But you know, when you think of, or when you think about how we go through a procurement process, typically the way it works is that one would typically try and establish a set of objectives that you want to um, achieve. And so here, for example, I give an, here, um, for, for instance, I give an example with a new um, university's um, project. And so in this example of infrastructure and procurement, you see um, that the client team, you know, I mean, um, very clearly sets out you know, I mean, um, a list of both primary and secondary objectives that they want to achieve. And if it's working well, this is how um, it should be. You've got to be very clear about what your objectives or what your outcomes are. And so when you look here, for example, you can see that there are, you know, for example, primary objectives relating to maybe cost, you know, I mean, time and quality. And then there are, you know, I mean, secondary objectives as well, and um, some of which relates to socioeconomic objectives, you know, I mean, that, you know, I mean, clients may seek to achieve, you know, I mean, with um, the procurement, you know, I mean, opportunity or exercise. Okay. And so once you've got those objectives, then what you want to do is you want to develop an appropriate construction procurement strategy to enable you or to help you achieve those, um, those objectives. Okay, um, and then that would then you know, I mean, um, lead to a set of you know, I mean, outcomes. And just before I get into um, the detail of that, I just want to mention that currently um, there is you know, I mean, um, quite a lot of work you know, I mean, that's um, been done internationally um, in relation to construction procurement strategy. For example, only last year, um, ISO you know, I mean, um, has published you know, I mean, um, a new you know, I mean, um, standard on construction procurement strategy, which provides you know, I mean, guidance um, on how to develop you know, I mean, procurement strategy 
um, and tactics. And then there's also been, you know, I mean, some um, significantly positive developments um, as far as, you know, I mean, um, the project management, um, you know, I mean, guide to the body of knowledge um, is concerned because they have also now started moving in a new direction, um, which, you know, I mean, gravitates towards, you know, I mean, objectives and outcomes rather than, you know, their traditional focus on tools and, and techniques. Okay. Um, but back to the you know, I mean, subject of procurement strategy. The purpose of a procurement strategy is um, to enable you to identify or to figure out you know, I mean, the most appropriate way to achieve the objectives you know, I mean, um, of your project. And this is where I really began um, to get into it. Because when you read you know, I mean, a lot of the literature you know, I mean, um, on construction management and also construction procurement, I think that the message you get is that we generally produce a lot of poor outcomes in the construction industry. Construction pro, you know, pro project outcomes are normally characterized by significant deviations from expected outcomes. And so shortly after I arrived at Vitz University, there was a, a capital projects program at the time that was going on, which was the Vitz University capital projects program. And, and that was in you know, a portfolio you know, I mean, of projects um, totaling at the, at, the, at the time about 1.5 billion rand, which had been done. And you know, um, the observation I found was contrary to a lot of what we observe in projects and in a lot of what was published in the literature. This you know, I mean, um, um, portfolio of projects had actually been delivered within 6% of budget. And, and that, you know, I mean, for me, you know, I mean, as a phenomenon, was very different from you know, the more general observations that were both in the literature and also in industry. And so that is when you know, I, mean, um, I um, got onto the journey of you know, I mean, um, trying to investigate this to identify you know, I mean, the um, kind of you know, procurement practices which had enabled the client to achieve this kind of you know, I mean, per, you know, per performance. And that is where you know, I mean, the whole idea you know, I mean, of procurement strategy and its relationship you know, I mean, with um, project outcomes began to you know, I mean, really and bear on me very, very strongly. So um, that was that project. And then, you know, I mean, um, you know, I mean, um, as, you know, more and more projects were done across the country, I am, um, you know, um, and mostly, you know, I mean, through um, Professor Ron Watermeyer, I got opportunity to negotiate um, access, you know, I mean, um, into some of those projects. And, you know, I mean, I am, um, so this one, for example, was um, education infrastructure projects in the Western Cape. And I got opportunity to be there for about two weeks, just um, sitting there in the offices and examining all of the projects that had been done. And you know, I mean, at the time it was, you know, um, but there was there's a traditional way in which they've always um, implemented their projects, which is um, through, you know, I mean, public works. You know, um, public works normally serves um, as the implementing agent for most public sector um, projects. And you know, private sector implementing agents have been brought in. And you know, I mean, I, we had observed that they were kind of delivering better outcomes. And you know, I, mean, I went in there to compare the performance of the two sets of projects that had been done to try and identify you know, I mean, what factors were making it you know, possible for the private sector implementing agents to be achieving better outcomes you know, I mean, compared um, to public works as an implementing agent. And that was a fascinating piece of research um, as well. But in terms of outcomes, you know, I mean, for you know, in most of the public sector projects, you know, I mean, we found that there was a deviation of you know, I mean, around 18% between the intended and expected um, outcomes. And then there was the new universities project as well, on which you know, I mean, I've carried out an extensive amount of um, research work. And on the new universities project, I'm going to dwell a bit on that you know, I mean, this evening. And this, is, this relates to I mean, phase one of the project. That too, you know, I mean, um, there was you know, I mean, quite a remarkable you know, I mean, outcome that was achieved by the team. Because that project, despite the fact that at the start of the whole project, up to at the time about 72, 73% of you know, um, the information wasn't known. But you know, um, the team you know, I mean, was very adept at you know, I mean, managing that huge amount of risk and uncertainty and were able to still deliver you know, I mean, the whole project within 2% you know, I mean, of the control budget. And that, again, set me off on a you know, research journey to try and identify you know, I mean, what procurement practices have really you know, I mean, made this um, possible. And I'll get into um, a bit of that you know, I mean, as well. This is you know, I mean, um, data which has always fascinated me. Um, because this is the kind of infrastructure project um, outcomes data you know, I mean, that I was more used to um, in the literature. And so this is you know, I mean, um, a couple of 
you know, I mean, um, large projects in the South African kind of environment. And you can see that just the picture of the story that this tells is typically, you know, there's very, very, very wide deviations between what we intend and what we actually um, achieve. And that is what made it, you know, I mean, um, necessary for me to do the investigations into the VIT Capital Projects Program and also the new universities program to see what is it that was, you know, I mean, um, making the team achieve much better outcomes in those projects compared to these projects. Um, you know, I mean, I've talked about some of the work you know, that's been done um, in the South African environment. And so um, someone might think that, you know, I mean, this is the only place where, where we achieve, you know, I mean, um, poor outcomes, but, you know, I mean, um, everywhere else is as bad as us. <laughs> you know, it's as bad as us. So this is, you know, I mean, a really interesting project from Scotland. You know, I mean, I know Ron likes to talk about it a lot. But believe it or not, I mean, this was, you know, I mean, a sporting and leisure, you know, I mean, public facility initiated originally in 1998. It was delivered by a design and build contractor 10 years later, 30 percent over budget and 40 percent longer than um, anticipated. And even after it was open, you know, and due to poor quality um, issues, you know, it had to be shut down again um, only after six years. Um, and then, you know, um, the whole thing was fixed again. Um, it was, you know, um, remedied, you know, and then um, eventually it costed, you know, I mean, twice, you know, I mean, the original um, amount, you know, I mean, um, that it was estimated, you know, I mean, um, to cost. And a lot of those issues, you know, obviously were due to, you know, I mean, the contractor's failings. But also, you know, I mean, and what an independent inquiry found as well was that some of that was also due to, you know, I mean, the client's lack of, you know, I mean, expertise. And I will talk a bit about, you know, I mean, the client's um, ability um, in a bit. Um, and then, you know, I mean, um, this is interesting for me as well. And um, the reason why this is here is, and um, so this is Dr. You know, I mean, um, Martin Barnes, you know, I mean, who wrote a really interesting piece of um, paper, you know, I mean, which was shared um, with me again by Professor Ron Watermeyer. Um, the key things, you know, I mean, from this paper basically is he did this fascinating work of tracing, you know, the history of the management of, you know, I mean, civil engineering projects in the UK over, you know, I mean, a period of at least, you know, I mean, two centuries. And it was very interesting for me to observe that, you know, I mean, um, the kind of outcomes that we are achieving, I mean, currently in construction, you know, I mean, projects. Um, and significantly different from the kind of outcomes that they used to achieve, um, you know, I mean, back then. Um, and then, okay, so um, let me just um, conclude here in relation to the first point, which is on project um, outcomes. Now, for those of you who, um, who may know this building, um, this is, used to be the tallest building in Africa, and there's one now in Egypt which I think has, um, has overtaken it. But this is the Leonardo um, building um, in Santin. This is while it was still um, in its final stages of, um, of completion. And the reason I've put it up, you know, um, is for two reasons. One reason is it, it kind of typifies, you know, I mean, the kind of outcomes, you know, we see in the construction um, industry. And so um, for, for those of you who, don't, who, are, who are not looking properly, I think you will see that, you know, I mean, it's being used and you might think that that building is complete because when you go even on Wikipedia, they say it was completed in 2019. But when you look very carefully, you will see that the upper floors, you know, I mean, um, aren't completed yet. Um, and the reason is because there is um, an ongoing dispute between the contractor um, and the developer. Um, and so although the building is being used, you know, I mean, the top part of it is still, you know, I mean, um, not complete. But it's the typical story of, you know, I mean, the construction industry and the kind of, you know, I mean, outcomes um, we see. And so when you look you know, across projects, um, I think that generally in terms of outcomes, I think one of the key things is that um, projects you know, typically experience significant deviations from expected um, outcomes. We produce inconsistent, you know, I mean, and poor um, outcomes. But just one point I want to make is that when you look at, you know, I mean, projects in other sectors as well, it's not, I just want to make the point that it's not only in the construction industry that, you know, I mean, outcomes of projects are poor. Then as I just reflect, you know, I mean, on the way we do procurement in the construction industry and also the kind of outcomes we achieve, one of the things, you know, I mean, that I couldn't fail, you know, I mean, to notice is that, you know, just when you look at how we do things, 
one would think that you know, I mean, as we engage more and more frequently in this process, we would be able to master it you know, I mean, effectively enough to be able to produce consistent you know, I mean, and expected outcomes. Um, and you know, I mean, it seems that we have still not been able to get to that particular point. And you know, I mean, one thing you know, I mean, that you know, I mean, um, portrays to me as well is that um, the current approaches you know, I mean, that we currently apply um, in the industry you know, I mean, um, for delivery um, management have so far you know, proved inadequate for producing consistent and efficient um, outcomes. And so um, in terms of um, outcomes, you know, I mean, um, that is um, where you know, I, mean, I am um, at the moment you know, I mean, with respect um, to you know, I mean, the picture um, we have. The next you know, I mean, um, area I want to um, talk about is in relation to the relationship between procurement and outcomes. So um, remember that I did um, talk to you earlier on about the purpose of a procurement strategy, which is basically to help you um, identify the best way um, to achieve the intended outcomes um, of a project. Here, you know, I mean, um, I have already talked about the Vitz University Capital Projects Program, which is you know, I mean, where I really started getting into this. And you know, I mean, um, this is the paper you know, I, mean, I want to um, draw you know, I mean, um, from in relation to the relationship between procurement and outcomes, because this is something that I extensively and deliberately you know, I mean, um, tried to get into with the new universities you know, I mean, um, project. And you know, I mean, this is where I'm just going to share a couple of insights on some key points, and then I'm going to um, draw towards you know, I mean, um, a conclusion. When you think of the relationship between procurement and outcomes, there are certain key variables within that relationship that I believe, you know, I mean, if we can you know, I mean, um, enhance our ability to deal with those variables, we will be able to enhance the outcomes that we deliver significantly. And so I'm just going to go through you know, I mean, the key ones, you know, I mean, um, which you know, I, mean, I discussed extensively um, in the paper, um, and I'm going to use that as a basis um, to move towards a conclusion. But in all the projects that were successful, which I analyzed, one of the key things I found, and this is both in the VIT University Capital Projects Program, and also you know, analyzing the relationship between procurement, strategy, and outcomes in the new universities program. The thing I found was that client leadership was a very, very strong variable. Without effective client leadership, we will not be able to achieve better outcomes. So that's a key variable. The second you know, I mean, um, point I want to highlight, unfortunately, Many projects in the construction industry proceed without a procurement strategy. That is something which surprises me. And the result is you end up, you know, I mean, seeing a lot of projects ending up with a wide gap between what was intended and what is actually delivered. Having the right procurement strategy developed by an experienced team creates opportunity to, you know, I mean, have a better chance to achieve intended outcomes of a project. And so in order, you know, I mean, for us um, to achieve better outcomes, having you know, I mean, um, an appropriate procurement strategy is key. The third thing I want to talk about is in relation to information. I know there are a lot of you know, I mean, um, professionals in this room you know, I mean, here um, tonight. Information, we all know, is a huge you know, I mean, problem in the construction industry. Um, if I was to talk about you know, I mean, information, um, we will be here. Um, all night, but this is you know, I mean, one of the biggest problems in the construction um, industry. If we want to achieve you know, I mean, um, better outcomes, we've got to find a way to make sure that information is very clear. And where information is not very clear, obviously that generates a huge amount of uncertainty, and the team you know, I mean, has to be more adept at finding ways to manage that risk positively. And that's the next point I want to talk about. When I was doing my PhD, the subject of risk management you know, I mean, um, is one um, that I focused on I mean, very, very um, greatly. And for a very long period of time, risk is something that many, many people saw negatively. And so as soon as a lot of people think about risk, what they think about is threats, is negative stuff. But with time, you know, at least in the literature, it also emerged that there is an opportunity side to risk which if we take that into account, and if we manage that in a positive way, it can actually become beneficial 
to you know, I mean, the, the project um, outcomes. And so, for example, I talked about the new universities project. One of the features of that project, although that project was delivered within only 2% of the control budget, one of the things I just want to highlight about that project is that at the time it started, about 70% of the information was unknown. So there was a huge amount of you know, I mean, risk and uncertainty there. But the team you know, I mean, were very, very you know, I mean, um, adept at managing that risk. And there is a paper in which I have you know, I mean, um, discussed extensively the strategies and techniques you know, I mean, that were applied to manage the risk positively and successfully in order to be able to achieve you know, I mean, um, better outcomes. The next point I want to talk about is pricing. So all of us know that before you know, I mean, um, construction projects start, one of the things we normally do through a tendering process is to establish um, a price for the project. Pricing, as important as it is, is unfortunately one of the things we do very poorly in the construction industry. We tend to price with too many provisional sums in the construction industry. I have had conversations with a lot of industry experts, some of whom are in this um, room you know, I mean, um, tonight, and some of them have said to me, that in a lot of the projects that they do, sometimes, you know, I mean, um, you, would ha you, you can have provisional sums of up to 60, 70% in the price of the project. I mean, that obviously does not create, you know, I mean, an ideal, because a lot of them are going to change significantly as, you know, I mean, the project, you know, I mean, progresses. And that is one of, you know, I mean, the key reasons why, you know, I mean, we achieve, you know, I mean, um, the kind of poor outcomes we achieve um, in the construction industry. So that is one of the key things we've got to tackle. And, you know, I mean, when I look at, you know, I mean, the more um, successful projects that I analyzed, there was a technique, you know, I mean, which was used, which was the discipline of the control budget. You know, so um, that control budget is set. It's not just a budget. And, you know, I mean, there is continuous value engineering by the whole team throughout the construction phase to always make sure that things are brought back, you know, I mean, within um, the budget. And so um, if we're going to achieve better outcomes, pricing and continuous value engineering in the um, construction phase is one of the things we've got to take very seriously. The next point I want to talk about is the program. So um, in the construction industry, um, normally one of the things, you know, I mean, that we normally have is um, we call it a program, but it's basically, you know, I mean, a timing of, you know, I mean, all the activities that we're going to, you know, I mean, um, pursue to be able to um, deliver, you know, I mean, um, the project. The program as well, you know, I mean, in most cases, it's not something that we do very effectively. I have looked at the NEC form of contract, and the way the NEC form of contract prescribes that a program should be done is actually a very, very detailed and comprehensive, you know, I mean, way. And if we do all programs effectively um, that way, we will stand a better chance of um, being able to deliver intended outcomes. Then I want to talk about the contract. So the contract that is used, you know, I mean, to create the contractual relationship between the parties involved in the project plays a very significant role in influencing, you know, I mean, um, sometimes behaviors, you know, I mean, of the parties, you know, I mean, um, within the project. And so just one of the key points I want to make here is it's really important to have a contract that matches not only the agreement between the parties, but also the kind of expectations you want to set up you know, I mean, um, in the relationship between the parties while the project is being um, delivered. Next point is in relation to delivery management. This is one of the key areas you know, I mean, where we've got to be really efficient because this is where you know, I mean, um, a client basically you know, I mean, um, puts you know, I mean, an effective somebody um, in charge of you know, I mean, delivering the objectives you know, I mean, um, of the projects. It's not you know, I mean, a role that you know, we historically find in projects you know, I mean, across the construction industry um, historically. But in the two you know, I mean, um, better examples that I analyzed, there was you know, I mean, someone playing the role of a client delivery manager, a client delivery manager in those two examples. And you know, I mean, in the analysis that was done, it actually came up that that you know, I mean, was one of the key contributors to the better outcomes. And then we've got you know, I mean, two additional points, which is you've got to have an integrated team. Um, one of the key studies you know, I mean, that was published by the Construction Industry Institute um, in the US was if you want to have you know, I mean, successful projects, there are three conditions for success. 
One is you need to have a knowledgeable and trustworthy owner. Second point is you've got to assemble um, a capable team as quickly as possible, but certainly before 25% of the design is done, which is not how you know, I mean, um, we tend to do projects um, in the construction industry. And number three is you've got to have a contract which rewards and encourages people for behaving um, as a team. But that integration and getting you know, I mean, the team to work together collaboratively is really um, an important enabler of better outcomes. And then lastly, but not least, it's about the professional team. Um, I have got a couple of things to say here. Um, in relation to you know, I mean, the professional team, currently, you know, I mean, one, of, one of the reasons the projects I examined were very successful was because of an approach that was used, which is the target cost contract approach. In the target cost contract, you've got you know, I mean, a situation or a scenario where the financial risk of the project is shared between the contractor and the client. In terms of the current way in which we appoint you know, I mean, consultants to do work, so you appoint an architect, for example, or a QS, or any of the you know, I mean, professional team members, when they do work, when information is late, they fail to provide information on time, or you know, all of that liabilities on the client, the client basically pays you know, I mean, for those mistakes. And there is no risk you know, I mean, and that is shared or carried you know, I mean, by professional consultants as a result of you know, I mean, and being late with information or having conflicting information or something like that. That is something that we've you know, I mean, um, obviously got to look at as well and try um, and find some kind of risk sharing approach you know, I mean, to deal with that. Because I find often that where you know, I mean, um, the risk is hitting someone's pocket, I think they tend to you know, I mean, um, think more carefully about you know, their roles um, and responsibilities. Okay, and so um, in terms of you know, I mean, um, those key variables, these are the ones um, that I just want to highlight. And this is just you know, I mean, um, a conclusion um, that I published in one of my papers, where you know, it's like a, a theory you know, I mean, that I actually you know, I mean, put forward. But what I said you know, at the time was, in a project where you have a construction procurement strategy, that is developed by an experienced client team and proactively implemented by an integrated delivery team working collaboratively, you're more likely um, to achieve the intended outcomes of the project. Okay, okay so um, let me um, move towards, you know, I mean, um, some conclusions. Um, so how do we tie all of this in, I mean, together? Obviously, I have um, talked about a couple of variables and, you know, just thinking, about how we tie all of this in, I mean, um, together. In terms of how there were three main, you know, I mean, um, areas that emerged, you know, I mean, when I put all of those variables or factors together. The first and most important one was client leadership. So the client is the leader of the infrastructure delivery process. You know, the Institute of Civil Engineers, you know, I mean, published a client guide a couple of years ago. And you know, I mean, the key conclusion um, that they highlighted um, at the time was the role of the clients is the single most important determinant of you know, the success of infrastructure projects, regardless of the size, the location, and the complexity. The role of the client is really, really key in determining success of infrastructure projects. The second point I want to um, highlight is delivery management. So this is something that is not um, that is not currently um, well highlighted in the literature. And when you think of the rules that we've got in the construction industry, currently there isn't really you know, I mean, a role like a delivery manage, manager role, but that is one of the most important roles you know, I, mean, I found in those two infrastructure delivery processes you know, I mean, as a key driver you know, I mean, of the better outcomes you know, I mean, um, that you know, were observed in those two um, projects. And so just one of the things I want to say is, just as we plan you know, for the future, that is you know, I mean, one of the key skills we've got to think about. You know, I mean, how do we create people with sufficient you know, delivery management skills to help us deliver you know, I mean, projects in ways that will enable us you know, I mean, to achieve the intended um, objectives? So that's one of the key things I want to highlight. And then the third area I want to highlight is the area of you know, I mean, um, governance and social value of construction. Um, in terms of the way you know, I, mean, I um, describe social value, 
A lot of the research I've been looking at um, recently relates to how procurement can be used to achieve socio-economic development objectives. When you um, look at the new university's projects, it wasn't just about building a building, you know, I mean, to create, you know, I mean, the physical, you know, I mean, facilities for um, a university um, to start operating. That infrastructure program was used as a significant opportunity to bring to achieve a lot of socio-economic development objectives in the two areas, you know, I mean, um, where those universities were built, and that has become one of the key or core legacies of those two projects. And so we've got to think also about, you know, I mean, ways to use um, construction procurement as an opportunity um, to achieve socio-economic development um, objectives. And so, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, with that, I want to thank you very, very much for your um, attention you know, I mean, um, this evening. I know that um, all of you obviously you know, I mean, um, had you know, I mean, um, other things um, to do this evening, but I really appreciate it you know, I mean, that um, you took time you know, I mean, um, of your busy schedules and to be um, here today to celebrate you know, I mean, um, this occasion with me. So I thank you very, very much, and I wish all of you a good night. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Laria, for that very illuminating uh, presentation. Uh, if someone like me can claim to have understood that I'm speaking <laughs> on behalf of most people who are seated here, I'm a chemical engineer, but I really managed to digest some of the things that you managed. I just want to say to colleagues here that um, actually this is how Sam runs his school. That level of uh, precision that you saw there in terms of procurement and everything. When you set targets with, the, with all the other heads of schools, engineers and many other professionals, they'll run off, they, they tend to round off. Like uh, when they say 275, they'll say 300, they're about. <laughs> with Sam, he will give you even the comma, 2.56, I say, but how do you get to that? I now understand, Sam, that it has to come with the profession. But then with those words, I think I must allow uh, Professor Hughes to please give us the uh, voice of thanks. Well, good evening. When I saw my name was last, I thought I was the headline act. <laughs> but now I realize I'm the punctuation mark. Um, it is a privilege to be here and take part in this proceeding, um, particularly a privilege because I very rarely see this kind of thing in England anymore, um, which is a real shame. Um, I don't remember seeing an inaugural lecture at the University of Reading for at least 20 years. Um, they've just disappeared, and I never had one. Um, so I'm very proud to be here to take part in this. Um, as Garth said earlier on, I've watched a few of these on YouTube to see what was expected. <laughs> and what amazed me was the, the devotion to the academic ethic that is visible at WITS and the pride that WITS University has in its professoriate. Um, and that's a, a marvelous and a wonderful thing to observe. Um, and so I was really pleased to see that and really pleased to be taking part in this. And so it falls to me to try and round things off. And um, it's been a delight listening to Sam talking through his work. And his contribution leads him to question how and why projects always seem to turn out um, so badly, not just in construction, but everywhere. And there are several things that I think are often missing from this, simple things. Like the simple fact that time is passing. So people are asked to prepare complex projects with information that's not complete, and it's uncertain, and we have no idea how much that information is going to have to adapt to the changing world that a project occupies during the several years of its life. So it's inevitable that things are going to be uncertain and continuously changing. 
And in that context, the idea of having a contract for a fixed specified amount of money for a fixed specified amount of time seems a little bit crazy. But that's what we've always done because that's what we always used to do. Um, but <clears throat> the world has changed quite a lot since the Victorian era when we developed these contracting practices. And one of the ways in which business practice is changing for the better is through the introduction of ideas in business of issues like governance, which covers a wide range of issues such as sustainability, ethics, social value, and so forth. And one of the things that's missing in contemporary construction practice is trying to bridge that gap. Organizations are obliged by law these days to have arrangements in place for their governance obligations. And we are seeing the emergence now of requirements for projects to also have arrangements in place for governance of the project organization. And as Sam has rightly said, the gap between a client organization's governance processes and a construction project's needs for governance processes, that's the gap that Sam's work is really targeted on filling, which is why he's talking about trying to get construction people to think about the project outcome in terms of its impact on society and the impact upon what it is that clients are obliged to try and do. And this moves the game a long way from simple, simply focusing on the objectives in a contract. So sometimes the language gets a bit confusing, but um, if anybody can handle this, then Sam can do. He's got his feet in construction practice and he's got his head in academia. It's a bit of a stretch, but he's a big lad. <laughs> so it's my duty on behalf of everybody here and everybody online um, to thank Sam for this marvelous insight into this world and um, wish him every luck in continuing to an answer these challenging questions and developing fresh questions. Thank you very much, Sam. So Prof Majosi uh, was saying that, you know, he is the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and the Built Environment. Uh, really got a, a sense of the, of the work that you do. I can tell you as a scholar in the humanities, I certainly have a sense of the work that you do now. So thank you very much again for that, uh, Professor Laria. I mean, it's, it's really interesting. We had this lengthy discussion this morning uh, about procurement, actually, and procurement inside the university. And of course, procurement is a big, big part of the institution, uh, given its shape and size. And so this, this is a really timely inaugural lecture, uh, certainly for me to attend as a member of the executive. So to those of you online, to those of you in the room, can I suggest, firstly, a very, very big thank you to Professor Hughes for your insight and vote of thanks, Professor Hughes. It's much appreciated. And I think another big thank you for uh, the inaugural lecture tonight, Professor Laria. It's been considered, it's thoughtful, thought-provoking, uh, and intellectually stimulating. And can I suggest that we all give Professor Laria another round of applause? As we, as we reach the end of the formalities this evening, I, I do want to make one point, and I would be remiss if I didn't make this point as a humanities scholar. Uh, your talk comes at a timely moment in South African society. It is a society that is currently bedeviled by the vexing problems of state capture, of a political and social malaise that has tended to send much of the citizenry into a state of paralysis. And I think it's important that public institutions like WITS really stands for 
the kind of role of an anchor institution to remedy and to offer remedy to places that have clearly gone awry and where our reliance on the political elite will not simply fix the problems of the day. And so again, Sam, I think, you know, when universities talk about innovation, we tend to think about innovation uh, very much through the lenses of spin-out companies, commercialization, entrepreneurship, etc. And those are important. But innovation is also about downstream social beneficiation. All innovation is really about applying your mind to the vexing problems of the day that face humanity. And this is clearly one of those. And so, again, I really just want to take this opportunity to thank you for uh, the work that you do, but also for being the kind of scholar that is likely to inspire others to take this kind of work forward. So thank you very, very much again. So as is tradition, it's the one time that a professor gets to profess and nobody can ask questions. <laughs> it's probably the only time that this will happen, so please do revel in the moment, <laughs> Professor Larry. Uh, I'm sure tomorrow you'll have people in your office asking questions all over again. Uh, but, but this is really the time that you have professed, and we thank you for, uh, for, for your professing today. And so this does conclude the formal part of the evening. But I would again like to take this opportunity to congratulate you. Again, this is a, it's an important moment. It's a, it is not only symbolic, it is the moment in which you stand up in front of an entire community and you say, this is what I've done with the last 20 years of my life. This is how it is that you've contributed to the last 20 years of, of my life. Uh, and, and this is my thank you to you as well for contributing to where it is that I am today. And so, uh, again, congratulations to you. I want to thank Professor Hughes. I want to thank all of you for attending this evening. I'd like to thank all of those who are uh, listening to this and watching this online. And I'm going to ask that you all just take some time afterwards when we leave, once we leave the venue uh, this evening, just take some time, uh, share some food, share some drink, uh, take some time to congratulate our inaugurating professor and really just spend a moment catching up. I think we've done too little of this over the last several years. Uh, universities as contact institutions are exactly that. They are about contact. They're about intellectual contact, they're about people contact. And uh, while I appreciate that there are many people online who are watching from a distance because they couldn't be here because of geography, uh, it's also fabulous to see so many of you in the room tonight. And I really hope that we can get back to the idea of an intellectual community that is vibrant uh, and that continues to bring people together in this way, even at this hour on a cold, rainy day in Johannesburg. So again, thank you to all of you. I'm going to ask you all to stand. And once the academic procession leaves the venue, I want to invite you all to join us in the foyer for some light refreshments. Again, a huge congratulations to Professor Laria. And with that, I declare this inaugural lecture closed. Thank you, everybody.